The funniest thing about my athletic story is that I absolutely had no talent whatsoever to do it. I want everybody to think preventative. I want everybody to be optimizing themselves, not going for a middle of the road, but going to be the best that you can possibly be. Today's guest is Lisa Tomati, a professional ultra endurance athlete turned into health, longevity, and high performance expert. You're about to hear Lisa's incredible life story, nearly dying on a five day run through the Sahara Desert and playing on the frontiers of longevity through hyperbaric oxygen, peptide therapy, and peak performance supplementation. There was this research that was not getting through to the cancer patient. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, intravenous vitamin C. Within 12 weeks, we got rid of the tumors. The actual beauty of the sport is the stuff that you take out of that for your actual daily life, because you know how to grind. Those are the wins out of ultramarathoning, not so much the physical stuff. Lisa. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Hi, Dr. Anthony. Just fabulous to be here. Uh, it was wonderful having you on my show too last week. So uh, yeah, great return. It is really fun to be able to collaborate and get to meet people from all over the world. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself to everyone listening, um, where you're from. And, and then this, this conversation, we're going to go into your absolutely fascinating life story from running hundreds of miles with ultra marathons to getting on the cutting edge of epigenetics and cancer care to doing all these amazing things. Like you have a really powerful life story and this is going to be one people are going to love, but just kick off with a very brief introduction of who you are, where you're from, what you do, and then, and then we'll oh, get thanks, into your Anthony. story. I'm very humbled and, and privileged to be here and thanks for that. Um, so my name is Lisa Tamati and I come from New Zealand, right down in the bottom of the planet, <laughs> um, born and bred down here. And yeah, as you said, I have a, a background as a, an extreme sort of ultra endurance athlete who spent 25 years sort of racing the world's toughest events and doing expeditions. Um, did over 70,000 kilometers in that time and uh, raced, you know, a few thousand kilometers in the Sahara and the Arabian Desert, Libyan, Niger, Jordan, Gobi, Death Valley, uh, Australia, Himalayas, all over the, all over the show. Um, and the, the funniest thing about my, my uh, athletic story, if you like, is that I absolutely had no talent whatsoever <laughs> to do it. So, um, <laughs> um, But I was just very, very determined. So really uh, the, the theme of my, my athletic career was you know you don't have to be the most talented you just have to be really have a good mindset and uh you know pick a sport perhaps that allows you to to flourish in that way so um ultra marathon mm -hmm. was certainly that and um you know it's blowing up and that time when i started doing it nobody knew what the heck ultra marathoning was how to do it i mean we didn't even know what salt tablets were or electrolytes or anything so we were the sort of the, you know early pioneers if you like and made a lot of you know mistakes along the way um, and then yeah later on which I will get into the story a little bit later on how that mindset that I developed as a an, you know extreme athlete really helped me in some situations that I faced both in business and in my family life as well so yeah that's who I am <laughs> mm -hmm. so what was your first race like how old were you and like how does someone start running ultra marathons what constitutes an ultra marathon like take us back to the beginning of this this running and ultra yeah, endurance so, career so i grew up in a house with um an, an amazing my parents were amazing but my dad was a real hard man you know he's one of those real tough hard good good hard men but he, he sort of pushed us hard and he expected a lot and one of the things he expected was for us to represent our country in some sort of sport and i was one of those little girls who really wanted to please their dad so i spent my entire life trying to please dad and um uh, and that sort of made you know drove me in the sporting arena to, to really perform as best as I could and I tried as a gymnast but then I you know got to puberty and I grew up too too tall and too you know not the right shape for a for a gymnast and um sort of bombed out at the age of 15 which was a huge disappointment to my father and to me and um gave me a lot of issues actually coming from that gymnastic background because young girls that are, go through gymnastics have, have a lot of pressure on in and a lot a lot of you know body dysmorphia and all of that sort of things thrust upon them um or it wasn't the case back then at least for me um so that gave me a lot of self-esteem issues and i think that opened up the, the door to, to some problems 
along the way. Um, <clears throat> and then in my early uh, 20s, I, my, my first relationship, my first love of my life was just this extreme uh, athlete from Austria. And he uh, showed me the world, basically. We cycled around the world. We biked, we climbed mountains, we kayaked, we canoed everywhere. We spent sort of five years sort of more or less on the road, you know, jobbing in between and having this adventure life. Um, but unfortunately, you know, he was a very abusive person and, and I was, you know, young and in love and, you know, he looked like Brad Pitt and, you know, <laughs> I put up with way, way too much more than what I should have put up with um, looking back now. And it was sort of like five years of, of my life that was, uh, it, it, it did a lot of a lot of good and a lot of damage, you know, but really shaped me for, for who I became. So in his, in his eyes, I was just absolutely useless. I couldn't do anything. I was, you know, below average genetically. <laughs> used to say you got really poor genes and things like that. You know, you, you're hopeless at running. You're never going to amount to anything, basically. Um, and, 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 and I believed it. Um, and we spent years doing, you know, all this crazy travel and it culminated when I was actually 27 years old, when we were doing a crossing of the Libyan desert. And this was an expedition, a four person expedition across a, a military barred zone. It was actually we were illegally there. We weren't <laughs> meant to be doing it. We we're young and stupid. Um, we did a 250 kilometer walk across this part of the desert that was really sort of unknown, uncharted territory we didn't have maps back in those days we didn't have you know um any sort of uh proper navigation we had with pilot maps uh and but it was the most beautiful desert on earth and there was a, the, a guy that was leading it and his name was elvis and he was a yugoslavian uh survival expert <laughs> he couldn't make this stuff up right um and, and and he was leading it and he'd been in this desert 20 years earlier and really wanted to cross it together with us so um it was extreme. We had no outside support. We had uh, 20 litres of water each. That was all we could possibly carry, you know. So our backpacks were, well, mine was 35. The guys were sort of carrying 40 kilos. And I was, you know, I weighed like 58, 59 kilos at the time. So um, that was like two-thirds of my body weight almost. Um, and so this was – we had to cover like 45 kilometres a day, and this was really extreme, really difficult circumstances with this – Two litres of water a day. Now, you, two litres of water in a normal life you might get away with, but not in 40 degrees in the Libyan desert. Right? And so this was pretty much on the edge. And uh, on day four, um, the, two, uh, the boyfriend at the time, he was giving me grief because I wasn't helping him with the photography because we were making a book from this as well. And um, I just physically couldn't. I couldn't run around and put up tripods while we were walking and, you know, keep up and do all the rest of the things. And uh, so he was having a go at me for this. And the leader of the expedition was like, leave her alone. You, you can't treat her like this. He was absolutely blown away the way I was treated. And he was so, so stood up for me. And it was the first time we'd ever been with other people in our relationship. And so that um, was an eye over for me that this wasn't okay and this – other guy was saying it's not okay. <laughs> and so these two alpha males had a big sort of fight about it. And um, the upshot of it was that on day four, when we were all, you know, to be fair, we were all in extreme situations, extremely dehydrated, which is like a torture you've never experienced in your life when you're that dehydrated. Um, and so you, you got short tempers and everything else, right? Um, he, he abandoned us. He said, right, that's it. You stay with him then and I'm off, you know, and left left us. So that was a, a really low point in my life where I went, you're never again. Is that going to happen to me? And I started to fall apart, and, and you know, as you do when your relationship breaks up. And then I thought, hang on a minute, I'm in the middle of the Libyan desert here and I haven't got enough water and I don't know if I'm <laughs> going to survive. So I better pull my, my <laughs> stuff together, so to speak. And... Um, I owed it to the other guys not to cause any more troubles as well and to keep going. And so the upshot of it was it was we, we, we battled through the next four days. We got we got out, but it was really touch and go, and that story's in my first book, Running Hot. Um, but it, it changed my life forever. I mean, it pushed me to my absolute limit, and we nearly didn't make it out. Um, the, the boyfriend also made it out. He actually got out before us because he was really fit and strong. Um, but 
it, it broke me in a lot of ways and it remolded me in a lot of other ways because I realized that it's not okay to be treated like that. I had to get out of this relationship, which took me another actual three years to get out, but that's another story. And so that was my introduction, right, to <laughs> um, doing long distance things. So when that relationship broke up and it took me two years physically to recover, you know, I had a lot of kidney damage. I had a lot of other problems going on. Um, but when I got through that, I was like, I want to do more adventures, but I want to do it in a more controlled manner. And I want to have some fun doing it. And I heard about this race, a, a famous race called the Marathon de Sables in Morocco. And I'd never run a marathon. I'd never run an ultra or anything like that. I'd just done a lot of adventuring, right? And it was 240 Ks across the desert. You were 700 odd people. You've got helicopters, you've got doctors, you've got you know, everything, you have to carry your own gear on your back, but you've got nine liters of water a day. And I'm like comparing it to the Libyan desert in my head, right? 250, 240, okay, nine liters, two liters, mm -hmm. uh, 10 kilo backpack, 35 kilo backpack. And it's billed as the toughest race on earth, right? Back then. And I'm like, I reckon I could do this. <laughs> and so I signed up for it, got some sponsors, managed to get down there. And the rest, as they say, is history because I was just hooked. I just loved it. I, I did really well, you know, like I was a, a rookie in the ultra running scene, but um, I did pretty well and I absolutely loved the the vibe, you know, the, the camaraderie. You've got 70-odd nations there and all these runners and we're all on this big mission together and we're all, you know, in pain and we're, it's hard and it's tough, but we're just fighting along together. And so that camaraderie really hooked me in. And that was the beginning of my ultra marathon running career. So yeah, after that, so sorry, long winded. <laughs> no, it's, I'm, I'm honestly captivated and I have a lot of questions. I'm so curious about is back to the desert. And I guess you can also mirror it in, in the, in the next race that you did. Um, where do you go in your head when you're, you're almost like at the brink of exhaustion and even death. Like what, how do you keep moving yeah. forward? Is there a kind of self-talk? Like what, what are you tapping into? Like, I think people want to know this because we have our own versions of, you know, going and showing up for a workout and it's hard, but I mean, that's like a 1% of like what you've gone yeah. through. So where do you go? What happens in your mind? How do you continue to push when you're that weak and, and devastatingly yeah, well, exhausted? Well, partly once you're in it, you don't have a choice, right? So these are, yeah. you're in situations okay. where you have to carry on or you're not going to get out, right? You, you occasionally get into those mm -hmm. sort of situations or where you've spent a year and a half preparing for something and you really you know, in it. Um, and mm. it, it often is harder than what you think it's going to be. Right. So you, you don't, we, we tend to, as humans, it's like, you know, when women say when they've given childbirth, are like never again. And then, you know, a year later, it's like, Oh, should we have another one? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you sort of get into the song, yeah. the, the glory of it all. Right. And you, and, and you forget about the pain yeah. and you, you do it again and you grow into these challenges. And so th the thing that I would say to people yeah. is you, you start small and like, you, if you if, 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 if your goal was to run an ultra marathon, you'd start and you've never run before the start run to the letterbox. You know, that's where you start in understanding that when you take one more step and one more step and one more step, suddenly after a period of time, you look back and you go, Ooh, now I can actually run 10 Ks. Ooh, maybe I can get to half a marathon. Maybe I can get to a marathon. And so you, you push your own horizon out and you start to see what you're actually capable of. And then once you're, once you're hooked, and you've got the actual um, sort of positive addiction, if you like, going on, then it's a natural fit. And you've also developed a habit of doing something. So it's, it, you don't, don't, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get off the couch for starters, you know, don't go, well, I'm going to run a hundred miles and, you know, do that because that will overwhelm you. So you have to have these little mini steps that may be your long-term goal to do such a thing, but you have to have, right, today's job is running to the letterbox tomorrow's job is running a kilometer, whatever the case is, and you build on that. And to answer your question, when you're actually in, in the hurt locker and you're in massive pain and you're really, really struggling, I would use a whole lot of different mental tricks, if you like, to sort of keep me going. One of the things I would say to myself was like, if your mother or your father's life depended on it right now, would you keep yeah. going? 
or your child or whatever motivates you, you know? And when, yeah. you know, I used to make stories, like funny little stories in my head. I crashed in the jungle in the Amazon and I've got to run 200 Ks to save my mother who's trapped in the plane and I've got to get out. What's, what are you going to do? You're going to yeah. run, right? And when you go to places like that in your head, you're like, well, if I could do it, if, it, if, if someone's life was on the line and I could keep going, then I can actually keep going now. You know, like it's all in your mind whether you can keep going and yeah, it's painful, but you can, you can do that. And the other thing I would do is like, I'd give myself little wee goals to go for like a treat sort of like, okay, if you can just keep going for another 500 meters, even though you're in hell pain right now, uh, you're going to be able to stop for 30 seconds and do a stretch. So you'd have that little goal to aim towards and then you'd give yourself that reward. And sometimes what you'd find is that you didn't need it. You just carried on because that moment had passed. Because all of these are little moments that we have in time that you're in the hurt locker and then five minutes later you might be fine. And you'd find that with ultra marathons, you'd do that, right? You'd be going up and down. And as the race wore on, mentally you're having these periods of where you're absolutely fried and then times where you're like, oh, I've got my second win. Oh, I'm absolutely fried. Oh, I've got my second win. And that, and so if you can if you can con yourself into the next moment, <laughs> sometimes that problem went away and, and, and sometimes it didn't. And then you might have to have a little wee break or a little bit of a, a you know, transition time or some, some sort of thing. But you, 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 you've got like, I call them the lion and the snake in your head. And they're battling each other, and the, the worse of the situation that you're in, the the more that happens. So they get louder and louder. Those voices of, you can't do this. Who the hell do you think you are? You're not good enough. No one cares if you stop. Just there's a chair over there. Why don't you just sit down for five minutes? You know, like all of those sorts of things. And you've got to have the massive, massive discipline to keep going. You know, uh, and, and that is where the that that is the the actual beauty of the sport is the stuff that you take out of that for your actual daily life because you know how to grind, right? You don't, you know how to grind. You know how to push. You know how to keep going when everyone else has stopped. You know how to take on massive goals. So if you can get to that point, those are the wins out of ultramarathoning, not so much the physical stuff, you know, or the medals around your neck, which mean bugger all at the end of the day. <laughs> for sure. That was so useful what you just shared I mean, just the, the subtle techniques. Um, I mean, and it also shows that we just do not know, we cannot possibly conceive what we're capable of. Um, we can't, it's just like this untapped power that it put in the proper situation and context, like we will rise yep. to the occasion and you're creating these occasions through story. I remember when I was a competitive bodybuilder, I used to do that. Like if there was a gun to your head, could I get another <laughs> squat rep? And I would do that. And like, the answer is yes. Like you do another one. Perfect. Um, I and that. what I think is so amazing about ultra marathon running is that it's something that like, maybe you can fail on like a 200 kilo squat on your back, but like with ultra marathoning, it's so brutal because you can almost always take another yeah. step. And like, which means that you could go on for <laughs> hundreds of kilometers, <laughs> which is wild what that must do to your mindset. And I, I suppose what people can take from this is the next time you're approaching your exercise or your workout, like there is a level to dig deeper and play around with some of those techniques. So maybe you're doing one of our pyramid style metabolic resistance workouts. Maybe you're just like, all right, just get to level eight, just get to level nine. And then just assess like these micro, micro. goals as well as the bigger picture yep. stories. So powerful and yep. amazing. Now I know your life kind of took a turn because you, you did many of these races yep. over yep. two decades. Um, and you met a ton of people world renowned and all this stuff. And then something happened with your mom. So let's kind of transition into like the next yeah, part of yeah, the story. Yeah. So, um, so it was nine years ago now, um, my mom, who was sort of like the rock of my world, you know, just one of those wonderful people, always there, always looking after everybody and just, just an amazing woman. Of course, I put her through a hell of a lot doing the stuff that I'd done. She was always there for me, right? And, and at 74, she had, she just, um, she was very overweight, you know, she was always looking after everyone else, not herself. 
And one morning she collapsed at home and I got that horrible phone call that we all dread. Get up to the hospital now. Mum's collapsed. We don't know what's happened. I get up there. The ambulance driver thought that she was having a neurological event, a stroke or an aneurysm or something, or something of that nature. The doctor decided that, no, she wasn't. She's having a migraine and just left her with some painkillers, right? And um, so and, and me being a non-medical person, I was like, you know, I don't, I, I didn't know what to to do or what to ask for or and so I'm sitting there with her and she's in excruciating pain and I knew that I she'd had migraines years before and I knew this was not a migraine I could you know I just knew it wasn't and and I but I didn't know what to ask for or what to do and I was just you know you listen to the doctors are they experts aren't they um and eventually after four or five hours I was just desperate because she had another massive attack where she was just, just in screaming pain and, and nothing was happening. And so I rang up a friend of mine who had crewed for me in uh, Death Valley and places and she was a paramedic and she knew the staff up there and I said, well, we're being ignored up here and I don't know what to ask for and something's majorly wrong, can you get up here? And so she raced up, took one look at mum and said, yep, she's having a stroke, I'm, I'm sure she's having a, some sort of neurological thing. She goes to the doctor and tells him in no uncertain terms, get this woman I know her get she's not a you know hypochondriac get her a CT scan right now and he finally relented and it was six hours by the stage and um, they took her through for a CT scan and it came back that she had blood right throughout the brain and she'd had a massive aneurysm and then they were like we oh we don't think she's gonna you know survive and that obviously made this horrific mistake uh, by not you know she'd been in there for six hours under their watch and nothing had been done and so they said, well, we'll get it down to Wellington because I live in a provincial area where we don't have a neurological team here. And so we had to wait another 12 hours for an air ambulance to come, which was the worst time of my life trying to wait for this blimmin' thing, right? And I remember my dad coming up to me, who's been married to my mum for 55 years, and they were like, saying to us look we don't think she's going to survive this is this is it and so my mum my, my dad was a um, firefighter and he was you know falling to pieces because this is his love of his life right and he was he was like well, we better start planning the funeral and I'm like I grabbed dad by the shoulders and I'm like dad she's alive and I've missed the boat this time but I am not going to miss it from here on and I we are going to get her back and we are going to you know go down fighting she's you know I want you to get my brothers get down to Wellington start giving people jobs when they're in a panic situation like that get their executive brain thinking so that they can you know snap mm -hmm. out of the panic and get into the action Get, get down to Wellington and I'm going to stay with mum and we'll meet you down there. And we're going to do everything in my power, dad, to get her back. I'm not going to be caught out again. And he was like, right, you know, he was on a mission. And about 18 hours later, we were finally got down to Wellington. The surgeons did an absolutely amazing job at um, stopping the, the, um, the blood. Um, and they put a stent into her brain and started to take the blood off the brain. And then they said to us, I'd never, never experienced this, so I didn't know what to expect. They said, she's, she's in critical condition. We won't know for weeks whether she's going to survive because when blood and brain matter mix, they um, cause massive, massive um, microglial activation and inflammation. And we don't know if she'll, she'll survive. And um, you, we'll see over the next few days if she goes into a coma or what, what's going to happen. So from that moment on, I really started to study and study and study and study and try to be hyper vigilant and watch everything that they did and question everything and push for everything that I possibly could. And, you know, this, I don't know what it's like in America, but over here, you better push for the resources that you think you need and you better know what you're, mm. what you're looking at and you better ask all the questions. Otherwise, you will not get what you need. And so I started to do that. And in the critical care situation, I couldn't really do a heck of a lot because, you know, really up to them. On the third day after the operation, she started to go into a coma and I come into the room and there's 10 doctors and nurses all working on her and I'm, you know, that most terrific moment of your life. And they, they pulled her back, they got her back into, they, they put her into the ICU and then I realised that the ICU was like way better, 24-7 um, care and that we should have been in there from the get-go. So it was another wake-up call that, you know, I didn't know to ask for this, I didn't know to push. So, you know, here we were finally in the ICU with proper, you know, vigilance happening. And long story short, she was in and out of a, a coma for the next three weeks, and every day she would lose more and more of her brain. So she was actually getting worse as the, as the inflammation took hold and as the swelling in the brain started to happen and all of this. But they got her through that period of three weeks where they did a coiling operation in the middle of it, 
um, and they made it to stabilize her and they knew that she was going to survive. And then they were like, well, what's the damage? The damage was massive, like massive brain damage. There was hardly any higher function left. So she was unable to know who I was or what she was. She had no eye concept of, you know, being a, a person or a woman or anything. She had no speech. She had a couple of words and that was about it. She was paralyzed on the right side from an, an extra stroke caused by the coiling operation. Um, so she was in really, really bad shape. And they said to us, look, this is really looking dire. You're going to have to put her into an institute there's not much we're going to be able to do we'll fly you back to New Plymouth we said, so we did that we spent another three months in New Plymouth and in this time I'm studying 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 like my heart out and I came across something called hyperbaric oxygen therapy and I started to realize that this was really a powerful thing for brain uh, repair so that was my mission then to get her this well, while she was in the hospital I couldn't do that but what I did notice in the hospital I'd done a race um, in the Himalayas uh, at extreme altitude and I'd been new using this thing called a hypoxico tent where they take a lot of the oxygen yeah. out of the air and you, yeah. you adapt to altitude, right? And I'd ended up with altitude sickness from this and I'd ended up with a hypoxic brain con uh, concussion from, from sleeping at six and a half thousand metres a night, which I shouldn't have done. <laughs> that's another story that's in book number two. Um, and But I, I started to have a proliferation of all the, the – um, the infections in the body because uh, bacteria proliferate when there's not enough oxygen, right? And I was having massive concussion symptoms and then my doctor sort of said to me, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, sleeping in this tent. And he said, well, you've just knocked a, a whole lot of brain cells off. I had a SBO2 stats of 70% at night time when I'd wake up and like really disastrous, right? I had no idea. But I was seeing the same thing in my mum. I was seeing a proliferation of all the bacteria in the orifices. I was seeing, um, mm -hmm. you know, what well, extreme fatigue was to be expected with what she was going through. But I said to the doctors, I want a sleep apnea assessment. I don't think she's breathing. And they wouldn't let me do that. So I brought in an outside consultant. I happened to have a friend who was a, a sleep apnea consultant. He came in one night. We smuggled him into the hospital. We hooked him up to the machines and we did a sleep assessment. And it came back severe, severe sleep apnea. She was already chain stoke breathing, so she was really on her way out. She had stats at 70%. She was like hundreds of times a night she stopped breathing. And so this was a, my first major win because then we could get a sleep apnea machine on her. And when she started to get oxygen, because the little bit of brain power that she had was being knocked off by the fact that she wasn't breathing, right? So we started to have little bits mm -hmm. of a win. And then after three months and fighting like heck to bring her home because the hospital wanted to put her into an institution, she was in someone else's budget then. If they sent her home with us, she stayed in their budget, so they didn't want that. So I had to really fight for the resources to bring her home. I did that. Um, um, I have a, a brother who looks a little bit like The Rock, and he sort of came with me to all meetings. <laughs> So that we, we would get what we – he didn't say and he didn't need to say anything. He'd just be there and it's like, don't mess with my family. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was like, whatever it takes, so I'm going to get my mum home, right? <laughs> and um, so the first day I got her out of the hospital after three months finally and she was in a wheelchair and she was, you know, completely gone, burgers. I took her down to a place where I, I researched a commercial dive company who had a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber, and these amazing people had said that I could use it. So we went straight from the hospital, didn't even go home. We just went straight to the to this uh, factory and stuck her in this hyperbaric oxygen chamber, and we did this every day according to the, the protocols and the stuff that I'd worked out. And after 33 treatments, we lost access to the chamber because it had to be taken off, but... After 33 treatments, she started to respond. She was starting to – she didn't get up and walk, but she was starting to use her hands. She was starting to try to speak. She had a flicker of intelligence behind her eyes, and I was like, this is working, so I'm going to – what do I do now? You've got another obstacle, right? Um, so then I, like, researched, you know, buying a hyperbaric chamber, so I mortgaged my house. I bought a, bought a hyperbaric chamber. I installed it in our house, and I, I started to put her through session after session, and putting her in this thing was important almost impossible because she had she was unable to move right so there was just obstacle after obstacle but as she started to have these treatments then I started to study functional neurology and I studied the vestibular systems and I studied keto diet and I studied supplementation and I put together an eight-hour program every day that I did with her and I was still running my own companies at the stage I was you know <laughs> blowing myself to pieces um, but I 
it's been, it's been all this time just staying one step ahead of her in her recovery and it was grinding. It was just thousands and thousands of hours of retraining her brain, you know, to do the most basic of things. And it took me two and a half years of this full on regime um, to get her back to full health again and full, you know, like, like out of it took, it took me a year and a bit to get her out of the wheelchair and taking her first steps. And it took me another year and a half and I got her her full driver's license, full power of attorney, full intelligence back, walking three, five uh-huh. Ks a day, going to the gym five days a week. She lost 50 kilos in that time. Um, and you know, it was just a, 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 a miraculous recovery actually, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a miracle. It was a, um, <laughs> it was a, a culmination of amazing research, amazing doctors is amazing and and dedication to the cause and i've actually um written a book about that that's my mum there for those that are looking on the video um and the book's called relentless and that really is that's what we took you had to be relentless and that's the value of being an ultra marathon runner right because i knew mm-hmm. how to grind out hours and hours of training i knew how to carry on when everyone's going it's impossible she's never going to do anything yeah. why are you putting her through such a torturous regime because you know rehabilitation is painful hard brutal like all of that sort of stuff and everyone's just just give her an ice cream and stick her in the corner you know and i'm like no way in hell is she am i doing that she's going to come back and we are on this mission together right and as my mum started to wake up as to what was actually happening with, with her and what had happened, and, you know, she went through a period of grief for what she'd lost, but then she fought with me, you know, and she, she cooperated, and that was absolutely key factor as well because the person has to actually want to get better and go through this torturous pain that I was putting her through on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. But and, and I had so many people that were criticising me all along the way and telling me you've reached a plateau, you're not going to go any further than that. It's impossible to do that. And as an ultra marathon runner, I'd always been told it's impossible. You can't run across Death Valley. You can't run across the Sahara. You can't run across in the, in the Himalayas. You can't do these things. And I did them. And so I never listened to people who tell me I couldn't do some. I always only listen to the people that tell me I can and here's how, and here's the next step. And and I put together a team of doctors and people and scientists around me. And that's actually what led to my podcast, Pushing the Limits, because I wanted access to the best people on the planet. So I started to have a show where I could interview the best people on the planet for Mm -hmm. brain rehabilitation. And then it went on from there, of course. And now we're, you know, nine years later. And, um, yeah, we've had other dramas along the way. But um, I'll I'll, I'll stop talking for a sec so you can get a word in. (laughs) It's amazing. I, there's not a, you were the only daughter she could have possibly had to, to be with her through that recovery. It's yeah. It's, yeah. She, and we are a team, you know, and we squabble <laughs> every day, I'm every sure. day we'll have little, and I'm sure people think I'm terrible and nasty and hard. And, uh, and I'm all of those because I'm a coach and she's my Olympic athlete, you know? I treat her like she's yeah. training for her Olympics. So at night time when she's tired and she can't get up out of her chair very well, I make her get up and I don't get her up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I make mm-hmm. her do it because I yeah. need her to learn to engage those muscles. You know, I need her to be balanced. I don't make life easy for her. And that's, you know, the, but I do that out of love because when if I take yeah. that away and she is helpless, and if I make her come, people don't need comfort. People need challenge, mm-hmm. goals, love, support, understanding, compassion. They need all of those things. But sometimes they need a hard-ass coach that kicks them in the butt and says, get out there even though you don't want to, you know? For sure. Oh, totally. I mean, that's that's an even higher form of love. What was your What was your dad like through this experience? Amazing. Like what, what was his impression through that? the whole time, the trajectory of his experience. He was amazing. My dad was just, um, he was, he, he, he loved my mum to to pieces. And I remember when we were in the hospital and there was a social worker who was hell bent on putting her into an institution. And I was the spokesperson for the family. I was the one that they were meant to go through. My, My dad was elderly. He was, you know, um, very frightened and, you know, in a, in a state of not being able to, 
I didn't want him talking to the hospital staff and being bullied. Uh, and, and they did. They, they got me one day, got him one day when I wasn't there, and they tried to get him to sign the pieces of paper to put his wife in an institution. Yeah. And, and I'd been fighting them, and they knew they couldn't get through me and that I wouldn't sign the papers. So they tried to go through my dad, and they did it in front of my mum. They were like, you are – your, your wife is knackered. She's never going to do anything. You've got to put her into an institution. Your, your daughter's very forceful, but she's not going to be able to cope. And you've got to sign these papers. And my dad went home to shoot himself in the head. Yeah, and, and we, had, we, we stopped him, thank God, um, because he didn't want to survive without his wife. And he didn't want to live without her at home, you know. And so, sorry. <laughs> When, when I found out about that, I did take my brother with me and we went back in and I threw my books at, at, at this guy and I said, you will not talk to my father. I am the spokesperson of this family. I brought a complaint to the thing and we had this big, massive meeting and they were all making the judgments on whether they'd let her take her home. And, you know, we, we, um, we did, we managed to get her home. And I remember the first day, you know, when we got her home and I had this plan, I had the little hyperbaric and I had all the things and Dan was just like, whatever you need, Lise, I'm here. I will be there. I don't care how hard the road is. I will be there for her. And he stood by her every step of the day, every 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 day. He would be there for her, fighting for her. Um, you know, my, my whole family were, and um, they were just absolutely amazing. And my dad was just, you know, and he was older and he wasn't able to do the medical stuff or the research or any of that type of thing, but he was there doing the hard yards, you know, changing her nappies and putting her in the shower and doing, making her food and going and shopping and doing all of that sort of thing, you know. And um, he was just absolutely wonderful. And unfortunately, sorry, <clears throat> uh, it's bit of an emotional journey as you can imagine um unfortunately i lost my dad three years ago and um in, in also very difficult circumstances where he we was in a hospital and had a aortic aneurysm survived the operation but they wouldn't let me do what i wanted to do which was intravenous vitamin c because he developed sepsis and i knew the research because i'd interviewed all the researchers on sepsis and vitamin c mm -hmm. and i knew that this is what we needed to get him if he was going to have a chance to survive the situation and i came up against the ethics committee who would not let me do something as basic as intravenous vitamin c even though he was dying and there was no other options i'd run out of options for him um, and so I fought for 16 days against this eth ethics committee to, to win the right to be able to do this very basic thing of giving him intravenous vitamin C to try to give him a chance to survive. And they wouldn't let me. And uh, I eventually did win the right because I found a legal loophole. Um, but I was been fighting for him for 16 days by the time I got the first intravenous vitamin C into him. And even then, it started to turn all the markers around. His CRP dropped, his, his kidney function improved. We got him off um, noradrenaline, you know, all of these things. But you needed it every six hours. There's a protocol being developed by Dr. Paul Merrick. And it was a six-hourly protocol and it was massive dosages. I couldn't get the full dosages and I couldn't get it six-hourly. I could only get it 12-hourly because I got my GP to come up. Um, but they blocked me. They blocked me. They would do things like send me out of the room to say I've got a meeting with a doctor, and then when the GP would come up, they'd tell her, oh, we've got no lines for you to put it in, you know, and send her out again. S stuff like that went down. And I saw the system turn on us because they didn't believe that he could um, – he, he, he would come through and just – get rid of him, get him out the door as fast as possible. And they were trying to get me to sign him off life support and so on and so forth. And so I battled, I battled and I battled, but at the end of the day I lost because we couldn't get that, what we needed. And we may have still lost him anyway. I don't know, but I'll never know now. And that's, um, you know, that, that's what drives me, Anthony, to, to help other people because I've seen the way uh, at least our system works and, there's big, big problems in our medical system, and there are some great people and some great doctors. And you know, if you break your leg, you want <laughs> you want those guys fixing it. They're great. They're great at surgeries. But when it comes to chronic, um, you know, conditions, when it comes to degenerative stuff, you better be up on it yourself because 
it, it it's the, yeah if it's not a drug and they can't make money out of it things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy just don't see the light of day i have a hyperbaric oxygen clinic now mm-hmm. i work in the space i'm in genetics i do um personalized health consulting and functional medicine um and that's all come out of this journey because i was like well i i have to i have to be in the trenches helping people because i don't want them to go through what i've been through you know yeah Oh, I completely understand. And your life is such a experience of the deepest pain and persistence that's transforming into service and love. And your fighting spirit is as tremendous as anything I've ever seen in a Just person. Just like yours. Just like for yours. Sure. For sure. I, I have one. I'm, I think they come in levels and degrees. And I'm, I'm humbled to hear the lengths you've gone in your life for your family and yourself. And I mean, this, this would be, this could be the whole story, but it, it's not, I know there's one more component that happened with your mom, <laughs> like after she made her recovery. So, I mean, if, if anyone is, 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 doesn't have jaw drop now, like here's the next and final part, let's yeah. get into that. What happens with yeah, your mom so next? After my dad died, of course, that was a massive shock to, to mum And, and um, she, you know, with the resilience of that generation, I don't know, she, she managed to carry on, but um she got um, almost three years ago now. Um, she she started to have facial droop again, and, and I rushed her into the hospital thinking it was another stroke. And it turned out to be after three weeks. By, by the way, they sent me home again. They said there's nothing wrong. I went back in two days later, and they sent me home again. And I said I want an MRI, and they said no, we're not doing one. So for three weeks, I fought to get an MRI, and when I finally got one, they said, oh my god, we've got multiple tumors all the way through the brain. Um, we are, we'll, we'll, we'll take her down to Wellington again. We'll have the same surgeon who operated on her the first time was kind enough. I chased him around the country, <laughs> terrorizing this guy um, until I got hold of him. And I said, do you remember Isabel? <laughs> and he said, yes, I remember the lovely mm-hmm. Isabel. I said, she needs your help again. Would you please operate on her? And he said, yep, get down here on Tuesday and we'll get her into the operating theater. And so this amazing surgeon did the surgery to take out this big major tumor that she had in her brain. And then they did the pathology and the, you know, whatever you call it on, on it. Um, and it came back to be an aggressive CNS lymphoma. So a, a CNS a lymphoma, but in the brain and a very aggressive form of it. And they said, look, she's got weeks to live and there's nothing we can do. And there are other tumors in there and, you know, get ready to die. And I just went, nah, that's not happening again. <laughs> I'm going to, I we'll, we'll see. And so, I, again, having the podcast came to my rescue because then I started to study the metabolic approach to cancer and adjunct therapies. And I started to interview one uh, amazing doctor and professor after the other. And I started to realize that once again, there was this world of, 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 of research and information out there that was not getting through to the cancer patients. And so I developed, a, I put a team of 15 doctors in different disciplines around here. I, we, we sold a house in order to pay for all this because it costs an absolute fortune. She had um, advanced genetic testing done. We worked out the, the what she would respond to. I couldn't get the chemotherapies and the immunotherapies that were indicated on this um, gene uh, test. So I chased all over the country trying to get private oncology to give it to us, and we eventually managed to get one called temozolomide, which is a, a mild, if you can say that, a chemotherapy that was not indicated for her lymphoma normally, but it was indicated after this genetic test, right? So I managed to get that in. And then I did um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We did intravenous vitamin C because there's a huge amount of research of intravenous vitamin C and cancer. We put in peptides, things like some thymus and alpha-1 and um, and others. And we put in um, a, a very, very strict diet protocol. So a really, really restrictive uh, keto diet, uh, especially at the beginning, and you know, really went hard. I, I mean, I, I chucked the bus at it. And within 12 weeks, we got rid of the tumors um, that were visible on the MRI. They all shrunk and went away to nothing, to no more visible on the, on there. Um, and we've been able to maintain. And you, now, you never want to say you're cured of cancer because we're, we're all producing cancer cells every day. And when you get older and your immune system goes down, then you're more likely to, you know, for it, for it's to rear its ugly head again. Um, but what I do is I stay very much uh, on my toes and I keep her on a really good diet. It's not quite as strict as it was at the very, very beginning where she was eating basically vegetables and that was it until they worked out what she could have. 
we then ran into some depletion of certain nutrients and so on, and we had to bring a few other things in. Some of the drugs that I had her on, off-label drug combinations like metformin and celecoxib and things, did some damage in the gut. So then we've had a few gut issues that we've been dealing with in the, in the past year. Um, so it's a, you know it's an ongoing uh, saga, but she's. Uh, at the at the moment, she continues to improve. She's uh, she went through an E. coli infection in, in December. Went out to a cafe with a girlfriend and ate something bad, and um, ended up with a very bad E. coli that also nearly killed her. Um, and so I've been building her back from there. That was my you know, November, December. It was uh, spent keeping her out of the hospital. And of course, you know, she was extremely ill, bleeding and, you know, just, just terrible state in the gut. But I managed to pull her through that one as well. And, and now she's getting better and better. And I've just been putting things in, new into her protocol that have given her another step up. So she's I actually took her for another driving lesson the other day because they'd taken her driver's list, uh, license off her when she had the tumor removal um and you know she's back to that ability a again now and she's walking better again now and we're back at the gym now and we we're, we're back into life and she's on these things called plasmalogens which i'm super excited this is the hottest new thing at the moment for me that have taken her when she had the e coli she lost the ability to speak again because the impact that it had on her brain and the reserve capacity is not there um and when i put her on this plasmalogens within an hour she started talking again and then she started to get better and better huh. and better so i'm super excited about this at the moment and um, they've been using this for things like Alzheimer's and things and autism and all sorts of things but um, so now she's you know in other words I'm still researching I'm still on the on the ball we're still training every day and now we're nine years into the journey and she's happy and healthy you know as, as she can be uh, she has some limitations but she can walk around she can go out with her girlfriends she can play with the grandchildren you know just uh, you know wonderful wonderful and I need to write another book because I haven't got there. But I have released a book called What Your Oncologist Isn't Telling You, <laughs> a very yeah. provocative title, yeah. which is actually the combination of 21 interviews with all of these doctors and scientists um, to share that information because I want that out there in the world. And now I work with a lot of people with cancer and um, also with strokes and aneurysms and dementia and things like that. I take so much hope from this conversation, hope for the power of the human spirit, hope for the power of family and love, what hard work can accomplish, what research and being on the cutting edge can do. I think you blend all these elements like so powerfully together. And I'm just floored at the journey. And I know we're like still in like a middle stage and you have so much more life left in you as well. It's going to be fascinating to see where, where you, where you head next and the continuing chapters that you and your mom write together. And of course, all the help and work that you're doing in, in the world. And I'm sure people listening to this now are, are fascinated by you and all the people that you have accessed as well. So I want to do another plug for your podcast, Pushing Thank the you. Limits. I mean, there's over 300 episodes that people can go to and listen to some very deep and specific stuff about longevity, medicine, yep. cancer, et cetera. So it's great. And I also have an yeah. episode on there too, if you'd like to listen. That was fun. We talked a lot about mindset and emotion, how that plays in. So let's let's finish this by 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 telling some general cutting edge wellness things that like perhaps hyperbaric oxygen and, and, and other things you think are, are very hot and that you would incorporate into your own life, like not necessarily battling chronic disease, but wanting to be yeah. optimal. I think people will be very interested to hear your perspective. Yeah, so on that, that. that is my focus now, uh, Dr. Anthony, is, is actual longevity and anti-aging science. And because now that I've gone through all of these, you know, sick care rehabilitations, I'm like, I want everybody to think preventative and I want everybody to be mm -hmm. optimizing themselves, not just going for middle of the road but going to be the best that you can possibly be so my life is you know i'm obsessive i'm an, an obsessive personality if you haven't worked that one out yet but um, you know i'm, I'm constantly uh, using myself as a guinea pig for different things i'm i'm on uh, so many different supplements that i'm trialing and different you know in, in engaging and testing and and i love that it's just part of who i am you don't have to go to that extreme i'm a huge proponent of hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh 
Um, it can be very powerful. It basically hyper oxygenates the body, um, and but it also causes um, uh, so a stem cell release, um, hits inflammation pathways. It compresses the size of the oxygen molecules, so it can pass through things like the blood brain barrier and actually supply mm-hmm. new, new fuel, if you like, to the the, the neurons and and uh, the brain cells that are struggling after a TBI or autism or cerebral palsy or stroke or multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or indeed cancer as an adjunct um, because cancer doesn't like to be bathed in oxygen. <laughs> it's, an, it's a hypoxic uh, thing. So, it, it, mm-hmm. so there's many facets on, on which it works. And, you know, there is so much uh, research out in the world. Uh, Dr. Shia Frati is one that you might want to follow or Dr. Scott Shear if you want to find out uh, more about um, hyperbaric oxygen. And I've got a few of them on my um, podcast. So that's something that I think if, you've, if you're having a major thing like like that and you can get access to hyperbaric i've got you know a soft shell chamber in my home and i've got a hard shell clinic you know with it with hard shells um a, a big proponent of that i'm also very much into the longevity supplement space so i have a company called avum labs and we are just starting our journey in the last six months putting out um longevity supplements that are really going to be focusing on in the first instance immunosenescence so we're going after the immune system because i I understand that at the basis of all the hallmarks of aging basically is the immune system. We need, it, it affects all of the others, if you like. Um, so we need to attack that, I think, as our first uh, protocol, at least within our companies, what we're doing. So we are looking at, at uh, ingredients that um, can really boost the immune system. Oh, not boost, it's the wrong word. I hate that word, actually. Modulate, Modulate the immune system. Perhaps. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you don't want to boost it because you don't want it to attack where it shouldn't be attacking. But as we get older, we lose the immune system. So there's a, a molecule that we're using or an ingredient called um, immune defense protein, which I'm very excited, which actually comes from a colostrum, a bioactive whey product, actually, mm. with 50 bioactives in it. And we're excited to get that one out. And it's com- combined with another one called Immunel, which is also another very exciting bioactive active from um, colostrum with different properties. So these are very highly concentrated uh, with all, without the downsides of colostrum, which can be, you know, lactose intolerance and, and all these, uh, a few other mm-hmm. problems, but all the positives with lactoferrin and lactoperoxidase. So that's what we're doing on the, on the supplement front. And then I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of sort of understanding the biochemistry, like an NAD pathway, very important. Sirtuin mm-hmm. genes, uh, the longevity genes that are involved with the, the seven sirtuins that we have. Um, so we'll be bringing out our own um, NAD uh, product that will hopefully come out in the next six months. But, you know, understanding these pathways, that's what's important. So spend the time educating yourself and don't think, well, I'm not a doctor. I can't possibly understand that. You can and you can teach yourself this. I'm proof of that. I haven't been to medical school. I don't need to go to medical school. I've taught myself and you can do that too because we have a a democratization now of information. It's no longer held in medical textbooks. You have access to it. You have access to people like Dr. Anthony and thousands of others who can teach you on a daily basis everything that you need to know. (laughs) You know? I love it. And insofar as the system itself, when you're in a hospital or an ICU, maybe a controlled environment, it's completely democratic with the access to all this information. And there's so much proactive stuff that you can do. Yeah. I love it. I, and I, I found this conversation so inspiring. You, you so inspiring. <laughs> and I, I can't wait to get this out to our communities for more people to know about your work. Uh, and of course, wherever you're watching this or listening to this, there's also going to be links to Lisa's various books, her podcast, her website, where if you want to consult with her as well, there's going to be access for that. So Lisa, thank you for your time, for your vulnerability, and, and honestly for living an incredibly powerful life. Thank you, point. Dr. Anthony. It's a wonderful. Uh, you know, we're we're brother and sister on a, a similar crusade, I think, just on opposite ends for of sure. the world, doing 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 mm-hmm. what we can with our skill set and and hopefully influencing as many people as we can positively. I absolutely agree. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks everyone listening. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Fit Father Project Podcast. If you love what you heard, please rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really helps spread this show to more men who need this valuable info. To watch full video episodes of this podcast and other motivational videos to inspire your training and more, 
visit our Fit Father Project YouTube channel. It's free and everything's made for busy guys over 40 like you. Visit youtube.com forward slash Fit Father Project to get access to our entire video library. And finally, if you or someone in your life is interested in becoming a fit father or needs help losing weight, building muscle, and living healthier after age 40, then visit fitfatherproject.com where you can see our proven programs, supplement line for guys 40 plus, and free meal plan and workouts to get you started. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi signing off. I'll see you in the next episode.